Hello, my name is Bob Scheibel. I am the chair of the organization Main Voices for Palestinian Rights. The mission of MVPR is to support the Palestinians in all of their nonviolent efforts to achieve their rights and their dignity as human beings. I am um, pleased to say that MVPR uses its uh, energy primarily to educate the people of Maine about this effort. We are very pleased to welcome to Maine uh, our guest on today's program, Nora Barrows Friedman. Nora has come here to talk and to further educate us, which is part of our mission. Nora is the author of this book, In Our Power, U.S. Students Organize for Justice in Palestine. Nora traveled across this country meeting with uh, many different students on college campuses to find out about their efforts in forming the various chapters of Students for Justice in Palestine. I want to tell you a few things about Nora. Nora is a journalist, she is an editor, she's a radio broadcaster, and she's a musician, and she's a mother. Nora has worked for the historic, or does work, for Historic Pacifica Radio Network, which is the oldest audience-supported public radio station in America. So it has a long and honored history and Nora has worked there um, for some years. For eight years, she was the senior producer and co-host of a program called Flashpoints. And this was an investigative news magazine broadcast, which was beginning to cover the conflict in Israel and Palestine. And for eight years, Nora made several different trips a year into Gaza, into the West Bank, where she was reporting on the ground about events there. So she's been there some uh, 20 or 30 times, and she knows her way around. Nora is currently an associate editor of the Electronic Intifada, which is an award-winning and widely read and acclaimed uh, news agency. Uh, for people who follow the Israel-Palestine conflict, they know Electric Intifada is one of the most reliable and professional sources of on-the-ground information. She produces a regular Electronic Intifada podcast, and she contributes uh, investigative stories and blogs for Electronic Intifada. She also has written for numerous print publications by the way, for our listeners who may not know the word intifada, that means rising up or shaking off. And the Palestinians have had two intifadas, though there's electronic intifada. She also has contributed stories for Al Jazeera English for Truth Out, Left Turn Magazine. Nora today lives in Oakland, California with her husband, who is an educator and a writer and a teenage daughter. <laughs> so Nora, welcome to Maine, welcome Thank to Portland. You. Thank you so much, Bob. Let me um, begin by asking you, what led you to decide to write this book? How did that come about? So I've been a journalist covering Palestine issues for 13 years. Um, but in the last maybe five, six years, um, I've been focusing more and more on solidarity efforts here in the U.S. I used to, as you mentioned, I used to go to Palestine two or three times a year um, and, and cover on the ground uh, reports about human rights <coughs> abuses and, um, and, and Palestinian resistance to Israeli occupation. But um, it was becoming more and more clear to me as, as a reporter that, that it's also important to, to really figure out how solidarity movements around the world are um, also organizing. And specifically in the U.S., you know, I, um, I, you know, I live in the Bay Area, and around 2010, um, Berkeley was one of the kind of these 
main focus points of, of student activism, where students were really self-organizing into these incredibly powerful coalitions, um, working with local communities and local activism groups um, to, to really campaign for Palestinian rights. And so I started covering it just because it was something that was really exciting that was happening in my local community. And then those stories kind of led to following the trail of student activism around the country. So um, this book is kind of a culmination of a lot of the reporting that I've been doing over the, the last um, you know, few years, but also um, really trying to, to put this, help put these students on the map mm. when it comes to um, uh, solidarity organizing. Because they don't exactly get a lot of mainstream media coverage, no. do they? <laughs> they? Not at all, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you know, like in the great traditions of civil rights and social justice movements, um, you know, the students are at the forefront of organizing. Yeah. Um, they're really, you know, they're the ones who are, are making the most noise and, and being not heard. Wasn't that true of the South African yeah, I think it was course. Hampshire College That's up right. here in New England, Hampshire which was College, the first student organization. 1979, they were and the first college. I think they were college. one of the yeah. first in yep. this particular effort, BDS yep. effort, right? That's right. They were the first college in the States in 1979 yep. to implement divestment against apartheid South Africa. Mm -hmm. And 30 years later, in 2009, Hampshire College again became the first college to implement wow. divestment against Israeli apartheid. So it's wow. really, it, that's kind of a, a very that, important, that's something yeah, special, it's very isn't powerful. It? Yeah. yeah. And so students are really rising up around the country and, and they're forming these incredibly powerful um, groups called Students for Justice in Palestine chapters. Um, they're, they're linking up with other local community struggles, mm. and they're growing this campaign day by day. It's, it's really well, exciting. Well, tell me, um, I think they've run into some obstacles, haven't they, through some headwinds? Can of course. Can you tell us some about that? Yeah, well, it's, uh, it's not easy to campaign for Palestine rights, for Palestinian mm. rights. Um, and you know, there's a, a, a very strong resistance to campaigning for Palestine um, by outside Israel-aligned political organizations um, who are really trying to censor speech critical of Israeli policies and are trying to brand this movement of solidarity uh, as one uh, of anti-Semitism, which is, of course, absurd. And there are many, many Jews and Israelis involved in Palestine solidarity organizing. And... Um, you know that 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 re that attempt to to conflate criticism of Israeli policies with anti-Semitism is really a, a, a very desperate attempt to sh to try and shut down and this I, kind and of and activism. I think, I think you would agree with this. I think that's getting more and more transparent. That it that's is, the aim, isn't it? It I think is. When they first started doing this, maybe they right. fooled some people into thinking right. these people are really anti-Semites. Yeah, but there's it's more crazy. and more Jewish students and Jewish yeah. leaders are coming out, right. that effort's getting more and more transparent. It is, and it really goes to show, you know, how they, you know, Israel-aligned organizations can't debate the facts. Mm. So they're resorting to these very troubling, right. pernicious tactics yeah. um, to try and, and, and censor speech critical mm -hmm. of Israel. So, you know, despite that, um, students are, are, are running up against these sort of obstacles where administrations are under pressure by uh, Israel-aligned organizations to, to stop student activism on Palestine issues. So students are actually having to, to um, really ne negotiate with uh, university administrations. Um, they're having to run through these bureaucratic obstacles where administrations would rather there not be direct action or, or events um, that, that talk about Palestine on, on campus. Mm -hmm which is a violation of the First Amendment. Um, mm. Students have a right to assembly, they have a right to organize, they have a right to free speech, especially on college campuses where academic mm. freedom is, you know, is, is something that's very um, dear and precious. To One would think that administrators would, think. would be a little more attuned exactly. to that right. on university right. campuses. And there are some great attorneys working on this issue who, who are reminding university administrations that there is no Palestine exception to the policy of free speech and academic in inquiry. Um, there's also no Palestine exception um, to the right to organize and the right to hold divestment resolution hearings mm. where students are demanding that their administration pull tuition dollars away from portfolio investments um, in companies that do business with Israel's occupation. And that's um, part of the uh, 
BDS. Yeah, boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Yeah, well, yeah. I'm glad you said that because yeah. for our viewers who may do, do not know what BDS stands yeah. for, and it was the same kind yeah. of movement, BDS, mm -hmm. as was successful That's right. with uh, South Africa. That's correct? right. So a lot of lessons um, learned from the anti-apartheid movement uh, in South Africa are being employed once again 30 years later here on college campuses. Um, there's many similarities between, you know, what's happening in Palestine and what happened in South Africa, but it's all, but there's also a lot of differences. And so, really, um, using the, you know, the, uh, the lessons learned from history is really important. But it's also, um, a, you know, a, a very um, serious situation in Palestine, um, and and students. Are, are able to really organize around the central tenets of, of boycott, divestment, and sanctions, which demands that, that um, international communities, that international civil society, that world leaders um, isolate uh, Israel because of its human rights abuses and violations of Palestinian rights, um, economically, culturally, politically, academically. Um, you know, just, just as was done to, to apartheid South Africa. Um, and, and it all has to do with really the grassroots power of activism, yeah. where students, civil society, activists, human rights advocates are all pulling together and becoming part of this global movement right. um, to hold Israel accountable because our international community world leaders won't yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that's an important part. Yeah. You know, I have um, from time to time heard people who are opposed to this movement mm -hmm say, oh, you can't compare the uh, Israeli apartheid to mm -hmm. the South African. They, they were different. And they, right. when they say this, they don't go into much detail, but they seem to be using it as a way to undermine the right. apartheid claim for um, or against Israel. Right. And yet, I've read and, and have heard things to indicate, indeed, they were different. Yeah. And in some ways, yeah. they're much worse the Israeli That's apartheid. That's what Desmond Tutu has said. Yeah, he was, and I was yeah. listening. I was watching a program recently in which a member um, of the uh, Afrikaner mm -hmm. class of South Africa is saying to us, "Look, we didn't have F-12 fighter right, jets. Right. We didn't have them bombing right. our homes." Right. There's one difference That's for right. you That's that right. in some ways the apartheid that Israel yeah. is engaged in is worse than yeah. the one there. Yeah, it's not just bureaucratic, it's lethal. Yeah. It's no. genocidal. Yeah. Um, and, you know, just look what happened in Gaza last summer. Mm. You know, a, a tr an entrapped population of 1.8 million uh, Palestinians, 80% of whom um, are refugees from villages that are on the other side of the boundary in, in present-day Israel. That's right, who used to live in what is now places like... Uh, Ashkelon. That's right. Who, they can see them, yeah. you know, from their rooftops. Right. And they, they used can never to be, go there. That used to be their homes That's right. until they were pushed out That's right. by some pre-Israel during the uh, Al-Nakba. But right. then I think even after the State of Israel was formed, yeah, absolutely. they were further There were, there were many, forward. many ongoing um, purges, know, sort purges. of. Or, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so we're looking at a, a population that's trapped on all sides. Which, uh, like, unlike other countries or places where when they're attacked, the people can flee. That's right. They cannot. They're not able to flee. In fact, Richard Falk, who's a wonderful scholar, um, he was the um, uh, former uh, Special Rapporteur for Human Rights uh, on the Occupied Territories for the United Nations. And he said um, that, that Israel, when, when it um, commits these acts of, of uh, violence and terror against uh, people in Gaza, whether it was in 2008, 2009, in 2012, and again this past summer, um, Israel is committing a new kind of war crime. That's what he said, mm. because of the way in which they sealed the borders so that mm. nobody was able to leave. During this last attack on Gaza this past summer, um, Israel would would um, launch uh, these so-called roof-knocking missiles at people's houses. Um, that didn't explode, sometimes they did, but that they were meant to really um, uh, warn residents that their house was going to have a live missile um, fired upon it at, you know, in whatever, two minutes, five minutes, yeah. ten minutes, um, and they were supposed to leave. And they tried to present this as, look how humane right, we are, we humane. warn people. 
but where are they supposed to go? So families were, were leaving their house, going to their neighbor's house, going to their relative's house. Those houses would also be systematically targeted. And then they would show up at UN, you know, United Nations schools, schools. And, and shelters. Those United Nations schools and shelters were, were bombed uh, repeatedly. Hospitals were bombed, offices were bombed, clinics were bombed, universities were bombed, 100,000 homes were bombed. Water purification everything, were bombed. Everything. So we're looking at um, 4 million tons of rubble that was created by Israel's systematic bombing campaign, 51 days of unrelenting attacks. Mm. Um, and, you know, as, as Richard Falk said, a new kind of war crime. And not only that, but, but Israel... Um, has, has also used new weapons technologies every time it bombs Gaza. And then immediately after these, these invasions and attacks, Israel's weapons manufacturers sell their, pro their new products um, to, to global markets, um, promoting them as being field tested or mm. combat proven. Mm. So really using Gaza and the West Bank and Lebanon as, as weapons laboratories uh, on living people. Wow. Um, for, it's, it's, it's sick. And so the international civil society, um, you know, has, has really galvanized um, in support of the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, um, you know, more than ever right now. Mm. Well, you know, um, from time to time, we will hear in defense of Israel and what their armed forces do and the reason they have to kill all these civilians is that the um, Hamas fighters will frequently use, is, is the claim, mm. Palestinian civilians as shields. Mm. And yet, the two most authoritative studies of cast lead, which mm -hmm. is 208, 209, mm -hmm. by the, um, oh, what was the South African jurist name who did the... Goldstone. Goldstone. Uh -huh. The Goldstone Report and Amnesty International. Yeah. Both of those reports said that they found no evidence whatsoever that Hamas was using human shields. Right. They said they did find people quite willing to criticize Hamas mm -hmm. for political purposes, mm -hmm. but none of that. On the other yeah. hand, they did find direct evidence, including testimonies yeah. from Israeli soldiers, yeah. that the Israeli army used human shields. Absolutely. And there was um, many reports since last, you know, during the attacks last summer um, of international journalists, Palestinian journalists, um, documenting uh, the mm. use of, of Palestinian human shields by Israeli soldiers, including uh, Israeli, soldier un Israeli army units um, uh, uh, handcuffing um, Palestinian youth, teenagers, mm. and, and putting them in harm's way. Um, uh, as human shields and in, in Gaza during the invasion. Um, and, you know, so this has been documented um, over and over and over and over again. Um, and, and I think, you know, it, it, we, along with boycott, divestment, and sanctions, um, international war crimes tribunals are, are also a necessity at yeah, this point. Yeah, yeah. Will, um, <clears throat> will you tell us a little bit about um, say, can you give us a specific instance where there's been an obstacle thrown in the way of students on campuses who are trying to organize or to advocate for the Palestinian cause? Sure. Um, there's so many. Um, I can think Again, of Again, let me say to our audience, <laughs> you can find more of this information in yes. this book. Thank you. Um, so just a couple of weeks ago, for example, I covered a story um, from uh, Southern California, uh, out of Pitzer College, mm. and students there were trying to organize an event uh, during Israeli Apartheid Week. And Israeli Apartheid Week is a global series of events intended to um, spark discussions about Israel's policies and also um, bolster the, the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. So these students, as part of their Israeli Apartheid Week events, wanted to bring uh, a mock apartheid wall on campus as a direct action and, and to spark conversations with other students. And, and, and the apartheid wall, again, for our yeah. viewers who may not know, is this huge wall which mm -hmm. snakes th into much of Palestinian land yeah. in the West mostly Bank. Into mostly into Palestinian yeah. land in the West Bank. And uh, while Israel has presented it as a wall to protect them from suicide bombers, right. it's really more a wall to steal land. And to keep people they don't want out. Yeah, and, and also to even keep 
Palestinian villages from their own farmland right. Right. to keep the villages from neighboring villages. It's yeah. a very insidious Absolutely. wall. Absolutely. Right. And the International Court of Justice in 2004 ruled that it was illegal and must be torn down immediately. That so was this is the wall ago. you're talking about where the right. students wanted to put a mock so, copy. So go Right. Ahead. So they have a, they have a wall um, that's been traveling around uh, different campuses in Southern California that's 60 feet long, 10 feet high, and has multitude of uh, artwork and facts and statistics and, and statements of solidarity from other student organizations plastered all over these wood panels. And 10 foot high yeah. is about a third the about height third. of the actual exactly, wall. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And it's a really powerful, moving mm -hmm. visual representation um, of, uh, you know, what Palestinians are subjected mm -hmm. to um, as an oppressed and occupied population in their own homeland. Um, and so Pitzer Students for Justice in Palestine wanted to bring this wall on campus. They applied like, um, you know, to, to, to the administration to have this wall um, displayed. The administration referred it to the aesthetics committee, um, which <laughs> wanted the students to jump through numerous bureaucratic hoops, file numerous papers, have numerous meetings with them, didn't even tell them um, some of the other uh, requirements that were, that were needed to, to have this wall approved. And so uh, the students were um, prohibited at the very end. They, they denied the permission to have this wall on campus um, because they didn't know about these other requirements. So it was a very kind of convenient and manipulative um, way to have this, this wall action shut down. The students knew that their rights had been violated, that actually, even though the aesthetics committee, you know, um, ostensibly was, you know, in power of approving or disproving um, this wall, they knew that this was actually a matter of free speech, that, that other students get to, you know, display other things on campus without even having to go through these kinds of bureaucratic measures. And this wall wasn't going to be up for a long it's time, It's going to be up for right? one day. Oh, heavens. And, I mean, if they're talking right. about a permanent wall, then you say, well, yeah, aesthetically, we course, don't, this is pleasant on our but campus. But this was a one-day, non-permanent yeah. display. Okay. Um, and, and the students knew that their rights had been violated. Um, and they also knew that um, pro-Israel groups on campus and off campus had been pressuring the administration to not let this happen. Mm -hmm. um, so students... Uh, called Palestine Solidarity Legal Support, which is a wonderful organization. It's a national organization um, of attorneys who are working to advocate on behalf of, Palest of Palestine Solidarity activists, especially on campus. And Palestine Solidarity Legal Support attorneys said, of course your rights have been violated. This is a free speech violation. They reminded the university, they wrote letters to the university reminding the university that free speech is still a thing that exists, <laughs> especially on campus, especially when it comes to academic inquiry and, and sparking conversations and debate. Um, and the students said, okay, fine, if, even if we're prevented from, from showing this wall, we're going to do it anyway. So they did. Oh, they wow. did it anyway. They defied these academic threats of, of suspension and, and um, uh, susp suspension of their student group. And they did it anyway, and now they're, they're waiting for the backlash. This, this happened last week. Mm -hmm. But the students told me in an article that I wrote for the Electronic Intifada that, um, that they're prepared to, to go through administrative proceedings as necessary to defend their rights to free speech and defend their rights to, uh, to organize on behalf of Palestinians. So it was, it was very moving, and it also points to the ways in which Palestine solidarity activism is really being, um, uh, trying, uh, uh, there are attempts to have it silenced and attempts to, to squash and crush dissent on campuses. We have just a few more minutes, and I wanted you just to say briefly about um, recently, or I'm not sure if it was recently, but you went to a college campus after the students had failed in their efforts to get a, maybe it was override a uh -huh. veto yeah. for divestment, and you went to where they were meeting expecting to find them really just upset right. and despairing. Tell us about that. Yeah, this was in 2010. This is actually one of the instances that sparked me to write this book. So this, this happened in, in Berkeley at UC Berkeley campus. And in 2010, the students actually passed a divestment resolution demanding that the University of California system pull its investments in companies that profit from Israel's occupation. So we're talking Hewlett Packard, Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, 
um, caterpillar. a caterpillar. All these, there's many, many. Motorola, which has been right. in, in the West Bank, I think, responsible for something like 25,000 yeah. homes bulldozed. Yeah, I, it's it's really unbelievable, and they're profiting off of the violations mm -hmm. of human rights and, and international law. So these students passed this divestment resolution. The, divest, the divestment was vetoed. Um, and students, instead of being defeated and saying they're not going to do it anymore, they were like, okay, we're going to come back stronger next year and the next year after that. And in 2014, they passed a divestment resolution Fantastic. and that sparked a wave of other divestment resolutions around okay. the country. I think that you will find this book filled with stories like that. And oftentimes we are maybe feeling that we should despair. Not so. <laughs> There's a lot of energy among young people yeah. in this country for this cause, and let me say, it's a cause for justice for Palestinians, but it's also a cause, I think, in my view, for Jews and for Judaism, mm -hmm. because in the long run, yeah. justice for the Palestinian is in the best interest of Jews all over this planet. I agree. Right? Let me um, tell our audience about a couple of uh, events coming up. On May 14th, here in Portland, Anna Baltzer, who is, I believe her title is national organizer for the U.S. campaign to end the Israeli occupation. She's going to be here speaking in Portland. And on May 20th, Dr. Mona El Farah, who is from the Gaza Strip. She is a physician. She is very much uh, connected to the Middle East Children's Alliance, Mecca. She's going to be speaking here in Portland on the USM campus, which is where Anna will also be, and she will be here on the 20th of May. Um, for those of you who are anywhere close to the Lewiston area, on April 30th, that's this month, April 30th, the One Woman Play, My Name is Rachel Corey, will be performed at the, on Bates College campus. And the film called Flying Paper, which is a delightful little film on the kids of Gaza who got together to set a new Guinness World Record for the number of kites flying in the air from one location simultaneously. And they did set that record. It's a, great film. It's a delightful little film. And it's going to be shown at Guthrie's, which is a a uh, little coffee club, a food club in, um, in Lewiston. That will be on May 5th. Thank you for listening to our program, and thank you, Nora, for coming to Maine. Thanks so much, Bob.